Julie. It looks like we're now live on YouTube. We're live at a YouTube link. It doesn't appear to be the link that was shared in the public agenda. I'm wondering. This is if, saying we're live now to everyone. Julie? Yes, it's, it's live, but not at the link that was published in the agenda. Can they, Julie's not back at her desk yet. <laughs> we're now live on YouTube. Yeah, you are. Yep. Live at a YouTube link. It doesn't appear to be the link that was shared in the public agenda. I think that's happened before, and we just assumed that people would figure it out. Okay. Are we all set? We are. Okay. All right, so uh, let's pick up where we left off. Um, I have one more comment that I was going to read. Uh, this is a comment from John Guttridge on the proposal for uh, the CPACE legislation. Um, he writes, PACE is an energy improvement financing program that allows commercial property owners to finance energy improvements that get paid for on the municipal tax bill. This is attractive because it moves the capital cost to an operating expense line that offsets another operating expense, meaning that commercial property owners are incentivized to make the investments, even though their tenants are ultimately getting the benefit of reduced energy bills. In the case of many commercial leases, the tax bills are passed through to tenants. In addition, because the financing lives with the property if the property is transferred in the long term, it is worth it to make the investment in things that amortize over a long time. Most commercial property owners don't like to make investments in energy improvements that pay back over a period longer than five years because they do not know if they will be holding the building longer than that and the value of the energy. Oh, sorry. I got, I got booted out of my email. Hold on one sec. You want me to read it? Yeah, actually, do you mind? Uh, hold on. Um, who did um, Who did it come from? I can probably find it. I'm back in. Okay. Uh, here it is. Yeah. Um, the the uh, most commercial property owners don't like to make investments in energy improvements that pay back over a period longer than five years because they do not know if they will be holding the building longer than that. And the value of energy improvements at a sale often does not get reflected in the sale price. The city adopted PACE a few years ago, but that program from the state expired. I'm ready to ask that you act at PEDC or council as appropriate to adopt CPACE, which is the updated program to allow local property owners access to this pro program again. We are trying to make use of this program right now, so prompt action on this would make a meaningful difference to us. Okay, so those are the comments that we got tonight. There are less to read into the record. Um, so next up is a uh, special order of business, a public hearing on the COVID-19 grant funds. Motion on the public hearing. Is there a second? Uh, seconded by John. All in favor of opening the public hearing? And that carries unanimously. And I don't believe we had anybody for that public hearing. But all right. So I'll look for a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, moved by Cynthia, seconded by Laura. All in favor? And that carries unanimously. Um, so are there any announcements or updates? Okay, seeing, seeing none. Uh, first action item on our agenda is the uh, COVID-19 grant funds. Um, and there's a resolution in our agenda packet, as well as uh, a breakdown of how these funds can be spent. And I believe that, uh, is Anissa still on the line? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm so Coming back to video. Hi. <laughs> I don't know if people have questions for Anissa about this. Cynthia? Um, well, first of all, it's it's great to see uh, all of these programs. And there was a, a quite a few submittals. And I, I think that those that were selected um, are those that would have the most immediate impact. So I, I appreciate the, the thinking that went into the selection. Um, 
in part of the review, was it considered that one group might be, it might be better to sort of have larger funds with one group rather than a, a small funds distributed among several groups? What was the thinking um, with regards to dispersing it in this way? Um, seeing that we have some funds as small as $10,000 and some as high as $25,000. Um, when we issued the RFP, we encouraged applicants to consider 10,000 their minimum. Um, and so the ones that were funded at 10,000, that's the amount that they requested. Um, and then uh, applications came in kind of at all different levels of the spectrum. Some more concentrated towards the smaller side, a uh, couple in the $60,000 range, which aren't reflected on what got funded. And um, I think it was two that were at the $100,000 range. Um, so the one that was scaled back was the Salvation Armies. They had requested $100,000. Um, and the committee, or I'm sorry, the board discussed all of the different elements of it and certain elements of it might have possibly been difficult to prevent duplication of services. So they kind of honed in on some of the services that Salvation Army could um, provide that others weren't proposing to provide and scaled it back due to that. But they didn't really talk about um, in, in specifically the way that you were just asking Cynthia, you know, the value of distributing like higher amounts um, to some groups. Okay. Thank you. Laura. Yeah, I just wanted to add as a liaison to the IURA, I have sat in on these meetings. And first of all, Anissa and Nels have done just an incredible job with getting information out uh, to the public. There were 17 applications in total, amounting to a total of $620,000. And when the IURA was discussing all 17 applications, all 17 proposals, they were looking for just what Cynthia mentioned, um, proposals that could have the most uh, immediate impact. And in particular, Anissa, correct me if I'm misstating something, but looking at issues of housing, housing security, uh, addressing uh, issues of homelessness, and also issues of childcare. As businesses begin to reopen and people return to work, they will, some will need childcare in order to be able to return to work. So those were considerations that were discussed at uh, the IURA meetings. And there were two meetings to discuss these, these proposals. I don't know if you, did I get that right, Anissa? Or is there anything that you'd like to supplement? Um, I think you did get that right. Uh, those were definitely um, issues they were discussing, Laura. They did um, make known in the RFP that um, issues relating to, yes, the, the three priorities that the IRA was looking to fund, but it could fund other priorities or, you know, that were coming forward from the applicants were, um, housing issues, like you said, emergency rental assistance, um, uh, services that would assist people experiencing homelessness during the time of COVID, and uh, the issues related to nonprofits that might struggle with reopening. And then the issues that you enumerated, uh, Laura, were definitely all part of that discussion. How do businesses reopen? or nonprofits reopen when there's no childcare, um, things like that. So yeah, I think you gave a very accurate summary. Okay, um, any other questions? Are we ready to vote? Uh, is there a motion on the resolution? Uh, moved by Cynthia, seconded by Laura. All in favor? And that carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, Anissa. Appreciate you uh, doing this critical work. Thank you. Um, okay. You. Uh, next up is the um, break in access at Fifth Street and Route 13. This is a resolution of support. Um, so we have we've seen this this uh, proposal before. It was here a few months ago. 
um, it's tied to the, the Carpenter Park development, uh, which they want to put a break and access on uh, Route 13. Um, and the project ran into some issues with the DOT uh, that had some concern about the traffic impacts that the project would generate. So we, we kind of pushed pause on this, uh, but we're bringing it back now because uh, those projects are moving forward. And um, the choice is really between whether we're going to do four-way intersection or whether we're going to do a three-way intersection. Um, so is there, a mo is there a motion to move the resolution? Uh, moved by Donna, seconded by Laura. Uh, discussion. Uh, Cynthia? Um, as the DOT has uh, identified that they identify um, negative traffic impacts as a result of the project, um, can you remind us between the three-way uh, three uh, intersection and the four-way intersection, what is the estimated um, additional delay time between the two designs? Um, I don't remember the exact delay time, but um, essentially in the analysis that was done, either option caused additional delay. The intersection itself caused delay because it was another place to stop. So um, I don't think that there was a big difference between the three-way and the four-way you don't recall there being a, a big difference, not a big difference. difference. Yeah. It was the intersection itself that caused the delay. Well, and all the, and the development. Delay. And the development. Um, I, as I think through, um, especially with regards to traffic and the concerns that neighbors have of uh, a four-way intersection re resulting in more traffic in the adjacent neighborhoods, um, I don't seem to recall any discussion of having um, Fifth Street be one way, like Fifth Street being exiting onto Route 13. Um, and I only say that thinking, well, that might have a marginally different effect to a four way that had Fifth Street going both ways. Um, but having it one way exiting uh, would provide, like right now, if you tried to come down on Hancock, you can only go right. Um, and then Fifth Street would be the next opportunity that you could actually turn left off of Fifth Street uh, into Route 13. So uh, maybe it's too late to add that as a discussion. And um, now that I'm talking about it, it probably is. But uh, I was wondering if there had been any conversation around Fifth Street being one way and if that would make any difference in terms of traffic impact and uh, on 13 and um, one way to mitigate additional traffic in the neighborhood. I, I don't recall that that was discussed. Okay. So our, our you wanted to speak, Seth? I was going to just ask um, if people want to just sort of voice their preference on the three-way versus four-way, but I don't want to cut, cut you off if you... Oh, I was going to. Um, <laughs> I, I think that in earlier meetings, I had expressed a preference for the four-way, and I think I still do. It seems to me that it would... Uh, that there's commercial enterprises in that area that need access to Route 13 that I guess right now are driving through the residential area, it seems to me that it would help relieve a little bit of the burden on Day Street and um, Third Street. Um, and I like the arguments presented in the materials that this conforms to our vision of the urban boulevard, although that seems like a really long-term vision. Um, and ideally have traffic mitigation and more pedestrian and, and bicycle access. I mean, I'm certainly in sympathy with people who, who live on the dead end and who enjoy the um, having the dead end of the cul-de-sac. But it seems to me that it's more in keeping with the comprehensive plan, with the fact that there's already some commercial development there. Um, and with uh, easing some of the burden from 
at least two of the other residential cut streets that I think the four way is more consistent with those with those goals. Do you want to make a motion to that effect? I'm I'm willing to entertain more discussion, but I'll make a motion if you think it's time. Come in, Steve. Move along. Um, so are you gonna second that, Steve? Okay, uh, then so I made a motion. Move it down a second by Steve. Discussion on the four way out. I can say that um, um, I can say that you know I I still support of the um, the three way option, and the reason is that I am concerned about the traffic impacts in the neighborhood. Um, you have Ithaca Housing Authority is right there. Um, you have a lot of families and young kids that live there. Um, I think my biggest concern is that there's going to be a lot of trips that are. Uh, generated from Carpenter Business Park, people that just drive straight through that intersection, especially if there's traffic build up on Route 13. Um, so, you know, and, and I do wonder, is it is that is there a possibility that we could like go with the three way, um, but then perhaps change and go with the four way in the in the future? Um, you know, is there any had there been any discussion of, about that? Are you asking me? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the way I understand it, you apply for a particular break in access. And then if you want a different break in access in the future or expanded break in access, you just apply, you would apply again for a break in access. Mm -hmm. So okay. break in access is very defined to what access you want. Right. And so I'm, you know, I'm sure there'd be the opportunity to apply again in for something different in the future. But uh, at once you negotiate with DOT, I think you have to have an actual specific proposal. Okay. Did that uh, answer the question? Yes, it does. Uh, Donna and then Laura. Two things. Um, so I'm assuming, Lisa, that that would work the other way as well. In other words, if we started with four-way and then thought, holy cow, this is crazy, could we put up, um, what are those things called, jersey barriers and make it three-way? Um, so that's a question. Then I have a comment for what Seth just said. Yeah, I don't know. Dealing I, with it uh, with the four way, so that you could back out of it to the three way. But I think yeah. if you go with the three way, you're going to be that's going to require additional study down the road if you decide then to go to the four way. Okay, so it uh, it seems like a possibility to me then that we could start with four way. Um, and if we really, if traffic is really out of control, I don't know what that means though. Um, we would, uh, then we could put the Jersey barriers up. I can. Um, so then I would like to, to react to what Seth said. And that is, but it's true that at many intersections with Route 13, there's family, there's houses with families. Um, those, I uh, um, can't think of the name, uh, the ones that cross from tops. Um, you know, they open onto Route 13. They're residential streets. And I think, I think that's, so I just want to make sure that we're consistent. Um, so to that, to that point, yeah, those streets have had serious problems with traffic. Um, and all kinds of debates about traffic calming and traffic calming measures that we had to put in. And I think that's my concern is that like, we could do this, but we're going to be right back here in like a year or two having a conversation about putting like raised crosswalks in there or having, you know, traffic calming measures. And, um, you know, I, I think you look at uh, Cleveland Ave is a good example of a street that dead ends at Route 13. And, you know, it's a very quiet residential street. It's very pleasant for families. Um, you know, I think that's kind of my thought on it. Like, I don't, I don't know if this is really going to do the having the four way there is really going to do much to like improve the overall traffic flow in the city, but I think it will make a, a serious change for that neighborhood. Um, it was, oh, sorry, Laura, I know you were, you were waiting. No, that's okay. Uh, thank you. I, um, I read through a number of the comments from residents 
Northside residents. And there seems to be overwhelming support for three-way rather than four-way. Um, I would favor three-way for many of the reasons Seth identified. I was pleased that there would be uh, pedestrian and bike um, access at the crossing, uh, even with the, uh, the three-way. I'm not really persuaded that um, a four-way would um, reduce the feeling of a major highway by changing Route 13 into more of an urban boulevard. I'm not persuaded that opening up Fifth Street changes the, uh, the nature or the feel of, of Route 13. And I am concerned with the number of families and children who live near that intersection of Hancock and uh, Fifth Street. We saw an awful lot of traffic on Hancock Street. There have been new stop signs included um, on Hancock and that seems to have helped. But I would be concerned about um, people from Carpenter Park cutting through Fifth Street. I don't know what businesses would be aided by an opening uh, of a four-way opening on uh, Fifth Street. So I, I am in favor of the three-way. Uh, Donna. Business. There's the. Um... I didn't see your hand, Cynthia. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You want to go first, Cynthia? Thanks. Um, I, one of my concerns is, I, I guess I, I understand what Laura is saying is that people would come out of Carpenter and, and go through this intersection to get into the neighborhood rather than take um, Third Street. My concern is, is that what will happen is with the increased traffic, and without this additional break in access, we're actually going to see a much higher volume of traffic that's going to be utilizing uh, Third Street and Willow to avoid the, um, the development as they get into town. So what they'll do is they'll come off the hill, come down 13, and then either take Willow or, th or Third to get into the neighborhoods to get straight downtown rather than going through the stoplights because now it'll be, um, the backup will, will be farther up the hill. So I feel like by having more avenues where people can um, go around the congestion of Fulton and Meadow, it would distribute it in perhaps a more even fashion than really just channeling uh, all the traffic to, to Willow and Third. Um, I will say that you know if I am coming from downtown and I want to get on to 13, I, I do remind myself that Hancock is a right turn only, which then drives me into um, the, the neighborhoods towards BJM to get back onto 13. Um, so by having Fifth Street there, you know, remember that the ICSD streets and facilities uh, uh, building is is in that neighborhood. Um, there's the, the stone um, distributorship, there's a, a towing company and, and other commercial areas there. So it does make sense that by having that fifth street cut, they could go directly onto Route 13 and be out of the neighborhoods quickly. Uh, Laura. And then, oh, sorry, Steve, were you next? Or you just, okay. Did Donna have her hand up? Donna, did we you have to, We went to Cynthia and Donna. I did have my hand up, but Cynthia kind of um, said what I wanted. That yeah, there's this, there's this a tile and stone company that right now probably works its way through 4th Street with, I assume, big delivery trucks. I don't know. Um, and also Third Street has plenty of families with children on it. And there's and that crosses Route 13 as four-way. 
So again, I'm in complete sympathy with the people on Fifth Street, but I wanna know what's best for the city. Um, so I have Laura and then Steve. Yeah, I, I too want to do what's best for the city. I too very much value the input of staff when we're considering these tough and less than completely transparent, completely obvious choices. So I do uh, respect that. Um, I mentioned families that are, especially along Hancock, third and fifth. We also have the Finger Lakes Independence Center uh, and Flick uh, has, serves population that um, may be a more vulnerable population. And I am concerned with increasing traffic in that, in that area as well. Um, Cynthia, I think when you're talking about cut through on Willow, it's really Day Street uh, that uh, people would cut through. And I will tell you that in my neighborhood on Willow and in um, North Side in Fall Creek, there's a fair amount of uh, delivery to go, delivery uh, cars, and they do come um, many, driving pretty fast through through the neighborhoods. So I, I still am in favor of the three-way intersection. Uh, Steve. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, 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 I think this is uh, this is definitely a tough call, um, but I come down uh, on I think the side of of Donna and Cynthia uh, their argument because um, I you know what we do know about uh, building cities is that dead ends are not um, dead ends are less conducive dead ends create a lot of a lot of other problems and. I'm not sure if this already was a pass through if we would create a dead end there I couldn't I'm, I'm trying to figure out the argument for like the reverse argument and I um, it's not there's not much that's resonating with me. Um, and I think, and I think when it comes to an urban boulevard if there is a good median there. Um, if there is a good uh, if there is nice flow through there if you are creating a, a scenario that. Um, is easy for bicyclists and pedestrians to navigate and get around, then I think that you can end up with something that feels a little less like a highway uh, as it does right now. So um, I, I think, you know, the best thing for a city is, is gridded infrastructure. And I think we have an opportunity to complete a grid here. So um, I'm, I'm supportive of that. All right. So um, is there any further discussion on Donna's motion? So all those in favor of the Donna's motion, which is in support of the four-way option. Uh, I see three and all those opposed. And that carries three, two. Uh, so we're back to the four-way option, uh, the resolution with the four-way option. Is there any further discussion? Are we ready to vote? So this would be going to uh, July council. Correct. Okay. Uh, ready to vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? And that carries 3 2. Okay. Um, next up on the agenda is the, uh, the open pace financing local law and municipal agreement. Uh, so, this is an incentive program that allows property owners to um, up do energy upgrades on their properties. And uh, we had a program, uh, PACE program, but to my knowledge, I don't think anyone in the city took advantage of it and it expired, but um, we've had a local developer, John Guttridge, I read out his comment earlier today, tonight, um, who's requesting that we move forward with this because he wants to uh, apply for the program. So, um, so in your agenda packet is a resolution authorization for municipal agreement with the Energy Improvement Corporation to implement the Energize NY Open CPACE financing program. And um, I believe there might be, is there, was there gonna be a guest? Oh yes, Sarah Smiley is here if people have uh, questions about this, uh, this program and how it works. Um, 
So maybe we'll just start off with a motion on the resolution. Is there a motion? Uh, moved by Laura, seconded by Donna. Uh, discussion. Uh, Cynthia, and then Donna. Hi. And I think, Sarah, you might have been doing the presentation last time. So if I recall, this is the third iteration of, uh, of this program that's coming to us. And um, I, I must say out of the, the three iterations, I do like this the most. Um, I, I appreciate the, the changes that were incorporated at the state level. Um, I appreciate that uh, the municipality itself is no longer the body that is either building or receiving the funds on behalf of the applicant. Um, I, I believe uh, it was inconsistent and I'm not quite sure. The memo says that the municipality is not responsible for guaranteeing the loan payment, but the language of the agreement itself seems to indicate that the municipality is still um, financially liable for the loan payment. So I did have um, a question with regards to that which we can talk about later. Um, the, the concerns that I, I do have with the program um, continue. Um, you know, I, I do appreciate that this program is limited to commercial and business uh, properties and residential properties of three units or more. Um, I felt very strongly that this should, is not a program that uh, is into, uh, easily understandable by your average residential owner. Um, and the reason for that is, and, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the reason that I'm, I'm concerned about it for residential use is twofold. One is, is that um, there is no accelerating the payment on a loan like this. So if it's a 30 year financing agreement, it must be paid over 30 years, you cannot accelerate it and, and terminate it early. Um, it was silent on that, but I think that that, I'm gonna assume that that's the same. Um, the other aspect to this is that it is a financing agreement that takes priority over traditional financing. So it only is second in priority to municipal taxes, but would take priority over any kind of bank financing. So if, uh, if an applicant thought that they might need a loan against their property at some future point, they might be hard pressed to find a banking institution who would be willing to be uh, subjugated um, after the repayment of, of this loan. Um, so, so I guess my questions to you for clarification is, uh, is it, is there a place in the agreement that I must have not read carefully and missed that articulates that the municipality is no longer financially responsible for, uh, for the loan payments that are utilized in, in our region as a part of this program? Um, my second question is, uh, could you confirm that there, you, you can or cannot accelerate repayment of the loan? Um, and then, well, the agreement already says that, uh, that this financial package is second only to municipal taxes and ahead of priority of traditional financing. Okay. Thank you for those questions. Um, I'm Sarah Smiley. I'm Director of Member Services for Energy Improvement Corporation, or EIC. Um, in case you're not aware, we're the nonprofit local development corporation that administers the PACE Finance Program. Uh, we do that on behalf of our member municipalities across the state. Um, so to answer your questions, this new version of the program, and I appreciate that the city has gone through with us on a couple of iterations of this, um, Open CPACE was designed to remove any administrative burdens from the city as well as any financial obligations. Um, so the city is, any municipality who participates is not on the hook and is not involved in any payment collection or remitting payment to the capital provider. So in order to achieve that, we have taken it off the tax bill. So the PACE charge that secures repayment of the financing, it's a special assessment on the property, but we've taken it off the tax bill. So it's, we've been able to subordinate it to municipal taxes. 
Um, so that gives security to the municipality that you will receive um, you know, anything owed to you first. And um, it is the agreement gives the authority to the capital provider and only to the capital provider to enforce the pay lien. And in order to do that, they first have to pay off any delinquent taxes owed by the property owner. And they have to follow the same timeline of foreclosure that the city would follow for delinquent taxes. And to answer about whether it can be accelerated or not. Um, so one of the benefits of PACE and what makes it unique and different from a traditional bank loan is that it does not accelerate, um, which allows it to run with the property. And that motivates building owners who might otherwise be hesitant to make energy upgrades because they don't know how long they'll hold on to the building. This motivates them to go forward and make those improvements because future owners of the property would receive the benefit and continue paying the annual assessment payment, uh, just as they would for other public benefits on the property. That being said, um, the uh, property owner enters into a finance agreement directly with the capital provider. We currently, it's called open CPACE because it's an open market commercial PACE program, which is another major change from how it used to be operated. Uh, in the past, EIC provided financing directly. Uh, so now we have a list of currently 11 capital providers. They're listed on our website. Um, and that also allows property owners to shop around to see who gets, who can give them the best rate for their project. Um, so they enter into a finance agreement with the capital provider and they can arrange to prepay, uh, but that is that would be in the finance agreement. So we don't govern whether or not they're able to do that. But normally the, the financing runs with the property because it's for permanent improvements to the property. Um, so yeah. I know Donna has been waiting, but uh, did you have a follow-up to that, Cynthia? So, yes, thank you. So, so you were saying, and, and thank you, this is a very interesting nuance. So, so a property owner can prepay, but even though they prepay with the financing agreement, the, the lien against the property, for lack of a better term, will continue for the duration of, of the term. And if they sell that property, it will attach with the property sale and the buyer would need to know that any future financing that they would achieve would be uh, subordinate to this existing um, agreement unless it had been prepaid by the previous by the seller. Correct. So whatever is remaining on the entire benefit assessment uh, remains with the property. Uh, so if they don't prepay the full amount, then any future annual installment would be paid by the next owner. Um, so because it is uh, takes priority over non-municipal liens. And it, it does that because it can only be created by the municipality. That's part of the public benefit of it. Um, the, we do require lender consent if there's a mortgage holder on the property. And um, you know, the nation, there are PACE programs nationwide. And I believe that there's a list of between 170 and, and 200 um, financial institutions that have given lender consent to PACE financings, um, generally because it improves their collateral. You know, they're, it's improving the cash flow of the property owner uh, because they're making these improvements that um, reduce their expenses and you know, in, improve their cash flow. And, and also because the loan doesn't accelerate, it's only the an, any annual delinquent payment that can be enforced. So that gives the, if the mortgage holder does want to step in, if they are delinquent on a payment, they can do so because they'd only have to pay any delinquent annual payments, not the remainder, the, not the remainder of the benefit assessment. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Thanks, sir. And, uh, sorry. Donna, you had a question? So I wanted to ask, this is so um, commercial, uh, so financial organizations lend money to property owners so that the property owners can make energy improvements. I don't really understand what role the municipality, why the municipality is needed. What role does the municipality have? So, so I think the answer is that we implement this lien. Otherwise, I don't understand why this isn't an ordinary loan between a lender and a property owner. I don't know. 
why the municipality is involved. Um, so you're correct that it does, it does rely on the lien enforcement of the municipality. And the state um, through Article 5L of the General Municipal Law established that it serves an important public purpose to provide financing for these types of clean energy improvements, whether it's energy efficiency or renewable energy, um, because it helps um, you know, reduce carbon emissions across the state, which is part of the state's goals. Um, so because they, it's been established that it fulfills this public benefit, it's only the municipality that has the authority to create this lien that runs with the property and allows these, this financing to be repaid back over such a long term. So um, you, you, know, you might be able to get a loan from your bank uh, for like you know, five years, which would really limit how much you could uh, improve your property because uh, each annual payment would be that much larger, right? If you're paying it back within five years. But um, because it's secured by this uh, assessment on the property that runs for such a long term, uh, property owners can afford much more significant improvements to their properties because they're paying it back over 20 to 30 years generally. So even though our, in our program, the financing is coming from private capital providers, um, it still requires to be enabled by the municipality because that's where EIC gets the authority to create the lien and we can then assign that lien to the capital provider. And if I could just clarify one thing, um, Ms. Brock, you mentioned that um, the three units or more is listed in the local law. Just want you to know, we also have a higher requirement in our program beyond what's in the local law. We require that there are five units in the building just because we wanna make sure it's strictly commercial properties. So that's part of our program guidelines that's in the handbook on our website. Thank you, that's a, that's a huge clarification. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comment? Um, so I'm glad we were able to move this forward. I mean, obviously it's, it's in line with our uh, goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and climate change and the Green New Deal. So I think this makes a lot of sense and we have a property owner who wants to do it. So. Um, I think this is, uh, this is great and I definitely support it. So um, if, there's, if there's no further discussion, we're probably ready to vote. Um, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries 4-1. Thank you very much. And that will go to the July council meeting. All right, and uh, that is the end of our agenda. Was there uh, amended minutes? Uh, just thank you very much for letting me join tonight. Yeah, thank you, thank Thanks you, Sarah. For coming, Sarah. Um, do we have, uh, I thought there was an amended minutes in the an email about that. There were, yeah, there were minutes that um, are changes that Cynthia asked for. Okay. And I've made them, I didn't provide those changes. Okay, um, so do someone want to move the minutes as amended by Cynthia? Uh, moved by Donna, uh, seconded by Laura. Um, all those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Um, just one thing I wanted to announce, uh, the next PDC meeting is on the third Wednesday of July, which is July 15th. And that is happening from now until the end of the year. I, I think we had discussed this earlier in the year uh, as a potential change. So just wanted to let everybody know that that change will be happening in July. And uh, okay, so um, motion to adjourn. Uh, moved by Laura, seconded by Donna. All those in favor? That carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Happy thank you. Bye. And thank you, staff, Bye. for working out uh, all the technical issues. <laughs> yeah, good we, night, everyone. We still need a little help, but we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs>